I'm delighted to uh, welcome Michael Howden to the Skip stage. He's the CEO of the Sahana Sof Software Foundation. Uh, has nine years of humanitarian tech-related experience. Has lived in Thailand and Indonesia doing humanitarian-related work and worked in Asia and Africa extensively. Welcome, Michael. to be here today. I'm actually an Auckland native and um, my sort of journey started just across the road studying at um, the engineering school here doing computer systems engineering. Um, like many of the other presenters after working in the industry for a couple of years I sort of really wanted to do something more. Maybe my underpants were on the outside and I had a bit of a superhero complex. I wanted to save the world. So after the um, tsunami, the Indian Ocean tsunami, um, I headed over to Indonesia basically started knocking on doors of NGOs until someone took me on as a volunteer. Now, I originally thought, like, computer programming in that field, sort of when you're looking at disasters like this. But when I started sort of seeing these organizations, seeing how they operate, I realized these are huge operations, um, and they need IT skills just as much as any other operation. I also identified the enemy. The enemy is Excel. <laughs> The entire humanitarian industry is run on Excel. A hundred million dollar projects like accounting systems on Excel. Um, so it, it has almost the past 10 years to, to make a better solution than just Excel. And through this, I've also realized that this is really hard. And one of the reasons, and I think this is one of the things you have to accept, Excel is actually really good at a lot of things. And one of the things it's really good at is giving people a lot of flexibility. Want to add another column? Pretty much any user can do that. And the thing I've realized is when you're coming with solutions, you're taking away some of that flexibility from people. You're, taking, you're disempowering them. Can, do you want to add another column? No, well, we've got the data model. This is the data model. Uh, we'd have to recode it to add another column. It gives them a lot of flexibility on how to analyze data and, and, and how to make their own charts. So I think this is one of my learnings, is, is when you're looking at you, your bright new shiny solution, what is it disrupting? What are you taking away from people? Another example is when you're looking at database solutions, you may be looking at sharing information more widely. Are you disrupting a, a, a monopoly where one person held all the records and that gave them gave them authority and power. So these are some, some of the things we need to be mindful of when we're working in the humanitarian domain. So after building a better in Excel, creating a very simple um, logistics database for, um, this is for International, uh, International Rescue Committee, was the first organization that I was working for, one of the logos that Chris um, came up with. I, they had a simple, it was actually an access database, um, which I sort of extended and um, deployed in a number of offices in, in Indonesia. Now, I, I either did a really good job or a really bad job, because next they sent me to Pakistan, which was a really um, interesting working environment, working for both the, um, um, the disaster of the um, earthquake, um, um, which happened in 2006, I think it was, but also the ongoing um, refugees from Afghanistan who'd been there since the late 70s. So these are two very different, um, different contexts. And this is one of the, the warehouses a remote warehouse in the tribal areas of Pakistan on the border of um, um, Afghanistan. They had a computer, um, no internet though, so having to build solutions that worked in that sort of environment. I was also sent to Uganda. Now this is one of um, where I was working. There. And, and one of the things you see a lot of, Excel is actually... I came to realize if you've got a really good Excel spreadsheet, that's a really good starting point because most of the time you had files like this or just information wasn't organized. And one of the challenges is you've got this idea of a solution, but what do they have in place at the moment? How are you collecting information at the moment? So I now work with Sahana. Sahana also has its origin in the, in the tsunami, but on the other side of the Indian Ocean in Sri Lanka. There after the tsunami, a group of um, tech um, um, enthusiasts, open source enthusiasts, um, got together and problem. And people talk about the second tsunami, and um, Chris sort of referred to it. It's, it's the what some of us call the organisations, and there's a lot of and coordinate these resources. So you're 
in overlap and avoiding gaps. So the first deployment of Sahana, which we're just showing a, a screenshot here of, um, unfortunately not the entire screenshot because they used a copyrighted image, which we've had a few legal issues with recently, so I've had to blank that out. But um, basically an organization registry. Who's, who's doing what where is one of the basic things, is what organizations are responding, where are they responding, what resources do they have. Um, having a request management, where are the needs, where are they coming from. Um, looking at a pe person registry, so being able to identify and help re reunify missing people. Um, a camp registry, so helping to manage camps like this, where are they, who's supporting these camps, what um, resources do you So Sahana was one of the first humanitarian open source projects, and this was 10 years ago. So a lot of this has evolved since then, and I'm just going to talk a bit briefly, uh, briefly about some of the, the projects that I've worked on with Sahana in the past five years. First, I just wanted to quickly talk about the disaster management cycle. Now, um, Chris touched on sort of the response component on, of this and some of the preparation. Um, but really, disaster management, I think a lot of people, when they think disaster management, they think response. It's, it's what you see on the news. But disaster management is something that happens all of the time. Um, and I think um, Noel, the work he's talking about is a great example of some of the sort of preparation you can do, which might not be directly involved. I mean, when you've got councils putting together plans, when you've got things like planting mangroves to mitigate um, storm surges, um, these are all sort of part of disaster management activities. And I think it's important to think of it holistically, not necessarily in a linear sort of one comes after another, as this sort of diagram indicates, because more and more we're pushing towards uh, these things happening in parallel. And I think technology and better access to information is one of the things that allows this really well on the work that Noel's doing is when you know, when you've got good data on, on who owns what land, then when you're starting to do your response, you can also integrate and start your recovery at the same time. So you're not building temporary shelters on temporary land, but you can actually start building shelters on people's own land because you know that information and you don't have to go and do another survey process after you've started your response effort. So this is, I think, one of the things that we can really help with is, is, is making the, integrating all of this, and that means the response is quicker and the recovery is quicker, which is a really important thing. Is I mean, I was in Indonesia for uh, two and a half years over various segments of time, but last time I was there was almost five years after the tsunami, and you still had people living in temporary shelters then, so you really have to appreciate this, that response and recovery can be a long process, and I think we're seeing that in Christchurch as well. So some of the um, deployments of Sahana I've worked on, um, this is the resource management system, and these are all um, different themes and different configurations of Sahana. This is a, a deployment that we did for the International um, Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent. Um, this is, we, we gave them a range of different functionality. The key functionality they're using here is the volunteer management. Um, the Red Cross has 93 million volunteers around the world. Now, I'm not quite sure how they came up with that number because the majority of these volunteer records will be in a handwritten register under somewhere. Now, that information will be collected and aggregated, but the majority of those records won't be um, digi digitized. Now, I think at the moment we have just over 100,000 volunteer records in this, so we're getting there, but still a long way to go. There are a number of other modules that we gave to them. We actually did some work on an assessment module, um, sort of some of the challenges that Chris was talking about. That was a really interesting project to work on because you can design an assessment piece of software, but you've got to look at how it fits into the organization. And we had, um, throughout the Red Cross, you have different national societies, and each national society has its own assessment templates. And some of these templates, the information they were trying to collect was really didn't make a lot of sense. Some of it could have been baseline information that you collect in advance. Some of it was was really not specific. Are you looking at just a village? Are you looking at a district? How would that information be aggregated? And how would you actually act on that information? And when we dug further, we found out that a lot of these times, the actual template, the actual sort of um, systematic process of, of um, collecting information in the disaster assessment wasn't really used that much. It was more about sort of people driving off on the back of motorbikes into villages, assessing with their eyes, maybe filling out a form. Those forms would come back to the office, 
sort of be put under a desk. People would talk locally about what they thought needed to be done. And then we're looking, and this is in Indonesia, and they, they head off data. process you have than that. So this is just a, a show of, of the resource management system being used in the Philippines and the operation system um, center there. Another project um, was working with um, the, the Government Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines. Now, this is a great example of where I think is one of the strengths of open source. It's about building local capacity. Um, we, we often think, when we think about humanitarian um, um, response, we think about the, the United Nations, um, the international organizations, but really the most important actors um, in humanitarian response are the local agencies and especially the local um, governments. And this is often really challenging when you have highly resourced international organizations coming into a country um, with poor governance structure, poor local government, and there's often a tension there where really the responsibility should be with the, with the, the governments, um, but the resources are with these international, um, often Western organizations. So there's a tension here, and I think one of the things that um, open source software can do is we can help to build that local capacity. So here, and, and 12, we spent a week in the Philippines working with a government software team. We went through a code sprint where it was a combination of, of training. We'd done some virtual training in advance, trying to make the most of our in-person time. And during that, that, that time, we went through a number of tasks that they needed to deploy. Um, sorry, some slides around the wrong way. Um, just the solution here. And it was basically a relief good and inventory um, monitoring system. So this meant when um, Typhoon Haiyan struck the next year, um, they had the system set up and they were able to use it to help track the majority of the relief goods that were distributed through the government. Um, so I think this is a really great example of how um, open source, um, humanitarian open source technology can build local, uh, local capacity. These slides here are actually later on um, in 2012 um, when um, Hurricane Sandy hit New York. We were also able to deploy Sahana there, working with um, the Occupy Sandy movement um, to help give them a solution to manage, and this you can see, all of the donated um, goods and help, this is me working with a couple of their, their team there, help coordinate requests for those goods to distribution centers. And this is a great example, um, and another one of the strengths is I see open source technology can allow really good um, transfer of knowledge between sort of, as Kate said, whether it's, whether you call it developing and developed countries, um, the north and the south. But one of the things I'm seeing is there's, there's um, similarities between these, two, between these two contexts, and open source technology allows us to take learnings from Philippines and apply them in New York, and vice versa. Um, the next example is a solution that we did um, working, funded by the UN, but working with the government in East Timor, Timor-Leste. Um, and this was to design a disaster management um, information system. And this is just a really a simple solution to help them organize a, a variety of information, both um, before disasters to support sort of coordination and collaboration and, and building relationships between the different stakeholders there and in response to disasters. Um, you can vaguely see it here, but we did a lot of work to make a really intuitive um, interface, um, sort of a news feed type style. Um, we thought, what's a, really, what's, what's a way of sharing information that people are familiar with? Um, and when they said, hey, this is just like using Facebook, we knew we kind of actually succeeded because it was something they could really use quite easily. Um, not the best ex example, but I just dropped it in. But one of the things we use heavily in Sahana is we really rely on a lot of the um, OpenStreetMap um, um, baseline data. Um, and a lot of the contexts we work, they have the best maps. Um, and what we try and do is a sort of a value add. The next um, um, project I'd like to share with you is, is a community resilience mapping project we did in um, Los Angeles. And this is working with a number of different community coalitions and going around and combining um, sort of baseline data with information from local government, um, US census data, US geographical sort of hazard map data 
to allow communities to get a better understanding of their own resilience and sort of map what resources and what communities. Um, one of the things working in this um, environment that was really apparent is, is, is who really adopts, um, adopts these sort of technology solutions. And we worked with eight different community coalitions and we found that the most engaged users were typically white, male, highly educated. And I think it's really, when you're talking about technology and early, early adopters, there are going to be some people who can engage really easily. This is really familiar to them. And there's going to be people who this isn't, this isn't so accessible to them. Uh, one of the things that Kate talked about, about printing out maps, is absolutely critical. I mean, we went in there initially with, like, here's your web map, because this is what we're really comfortable with. But for a lot of people, a map is still a book. Um, and so it's about working out what, what they're comfortable with and, and making and that focus on accessibility. So just talking a bit about where Sahana is now, um, there's been a, a number of versions and different revisions and a couple of rewrites of the project over the, of the software over the past um, 10 years as it's been going. The current version is, is Sahana Eden. There was a long debate about that name. Um, some, some use it as an acronym for... Um, Emergencies Development Environment. Um, I actually proposed it because I come from Mount Eden, which is a suburb just sort of five kilometers that way. Um, it's a web application. Um, it's built on the um, Web2Py um, framework, which some of you might be familiar with, um, using Python. We've really focused on a, on a RAD, Rapid Application Development Framework, so it's really easy to deploy instances and to create new modules. Now, there's a bit of a double-edged sword there because it's really easy to write modules, it's really easy to write that code, but to get people to use it, to get people to get value out of that is something which is much more challenging. And I think that's, that's something to be really mindful of when you're engaging in, in humanitarian open source technology, is the technology, I say technology is easy, people are hard. So you can have the best solution, but you've still got to get people to, to use it. And I mean, one of the there's one one blog post I read is, is the technology is actually only 10% of the solution, and that the rest is sort of working with people, making sure that there's there's user guides on how people can use the software, making sure it's really I think one of the key things it's adding value to them, um, and in that value equation you've got to keep in mind of the cost. I mean, any adopting any new technology there's a cost to that. So we've got to make sure the value outweighs that cost and um, that people are prepared to make that initial investment. Um, we've got a, a full RESTful API and we support data integration through XML, JSON, um, Excel. It's the enemy, but we're still trying to subvert it. And um, CSV. Um, and I think this is one of the other things. is There's a lot of different technologies around at the moment. I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, how do you choose the best technology? Do we have to have one platform? Um, and I, I said, no, that's, that's never going to happen. One of the, the key critical things, um, though, is to make sure that different platforms can talk to each other. We do a lot of work on open data standards and making sure that different solutions can, can interoperate so that you don't have to have everyone using the same solution. Um, one of the things we put a lot of work into, and you've seen a number of different screenshots that all look quite different, is, is different themes and different templates to allow... Um, Sahana to be configured and used in lots of different contexts. Um, so this is what we've been doing over the past years. Um, I've actually re only recently come on as, as the CEO of Sahana six months ago. And one of our focuses now is to really, we've, had, we've done all these deployments, we've worked in a lot of different contexts. And a lot of people say every context is different, every country is different, and every disaster is different. And there's some truth to that, but there's also a lot of similarities. And I think that's where we can actually, and what one of our aims at the moment and our strategic goals for the next year is to look at really putting a lot more investment into the core default generic Sahana um, so that some people have something that they can easily use out of the box. And that's not just the technology, but that's the training material um, and sort of guides on how they can deploy it, how they can integrate it, uh, implement it in their organizations as well. 
Um, so if any of you are interested in, in contributing and, and engaging with this, um, here's a link on how to get started or just come and have a, a chat to me. This is sort of a more um, technical if you're interested in contributing code. But as I said, code is not is only a sort of 10% of the solution. There's a lot more. We're trying to get better sort of communication material, better engagement. We're trying to engage stakeholders to set up local branches throughout the world as well. So there's a lot of work to be done. So if, any, if you are interested in getting involved, especially if you're based in Auckland, I'm based here too and are hoping to do some events later on in the year here. Um, just talking more generally about sort of um, humanitarian open source, one of the, the key differences between um, sort of humanitarian open source and open source projects, this is maybe a bit of a generalization, but in most open source projects you've got users and then contributors to that project are sort of a subgroup of those users. It's people who've dived in, who found out that they've got an itch to scratch and they scratch that itch and they start contributing. Maybe they've found a bug and they fix that bug. Now, humanitarian open source projects are different in that respect. The majority of users are people who have no interest in contributing to an open source project in terms of code. I mean, and there's a lot of debate around this in terms of just being a user and giving good climate feedback. The majority of are also not going to be users of that code. And I think that means that we have to put additional thought into how do we make these solutions accessible for people who aren't us, for people who aren't like us, for people who don't have the same skills as us, um, to telling people to say, to make it accessible for people to learn how to install it, how to use it, telling people to go and fork a repository on GitHub. Um, for the majority of users we deal with, whoosh, and I think we even need just to watch our language because, I mean, it's not just over your head. It's, uh, that's, that's not something for me. Um, and I think it's something we really need to be, I mean, in terms of accessibility, um, an open source license is really, I think there's a lot of, I, I totally agree with that. But for most people and most users, that doesn't make it accessible. That, that, that they may not, might not even understand. Most of the um, organizations we've, we've worked with, they don't, Many of them don't even care about the fact that it's open source. They just want a solution. Um, I think it's really valuable that we've been able to sort of cross-pollinate um, development that we've done between things that have been funded by the Red Cross, the UN, the government, and, and, and the US as well. But I think that, 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 user, that accessibility thing, it means that we have to have more focus on, on design, um, better um, user experience and user interfaces, so that people don't have to sort of read long manuals or explore um, for themselves, to really reducing that investment that people need to make to start using the humanitarian tech. So that's all. I think it's lunchtime now, and we're coming back 120. 120. So thank you um, very much for listening, and look forward to the panel discussion afterwards. <laughs>